What's up again? It's Keyshawn, and welcome to my show, Undisputed Presents, All Facts, No Breaks. Joining me today is a Heisman Trophy winner, Tennessee Titans all-time leading rusher, four-time pro bowler, two-time all-pro, and the head football coach of the Tennessee State. What is that, Eddie? Tennessee State what? Eddie George. Yes, sir. What is Tennessee it? Tennessee State, State what? Tennessee State Tigers. The Tennessee, Tennessee State Tigers. State yes. Tigers. I almost said the Tennessee yes. State Vols, but that's the other team that's probably not as good as your team that's coached by you. What's up, man? <laughs> man, I'm good, man. Oh, God. My son is trying to call me at the wrong time, but <laughs> he, and he plays for me, so he's probably throwing up in the, uh, in the indoor right now, upset, talking about how hard the workout was. But, hey, man, it's always a blessing to see you, man. You're always doing great things. You know, we go all way back to 96, man. And I had no doubt that once you were done playing, you were you're doing your thing as a businessman and you got your shows, brother. You're just doing awesome. Good to see you. I'm, I'm curious to know, though, at what, 52 years old, how are you able to have that full head of hair? But it's is, not, is it's, that, it's a, a fro hawk, man. If you, if so, is, but how, but how is that possible, though? How is it? <laughs> See, that's the I'm not, LA hey, and I'm not, hey, and I'm not 52, I'm 51. I'll be 52 in a few months, but not yet. Don't, right. speed, don't speed it up. I think it's, to be honest with you, Eddie, I tell people all the time, I look the way I look because I don't stress. <laughs> I'm chill. I don't worry about anything. I don't have anxiety. I don't have any of that sort of stuff. I take it one day at a time. And that's real, that's honest, real honest, man, because... You know, there are people my age and people in my family that, you know, they lose a little bit of hair. But for me, I'm just, everything is just, I don't know. And I eat well. I eat well. I don't, uh -huh. eat, I don't eat a bunch of trash. But you got your yeah, son. Yeah. You have your son on your football team. And I actually have my son working with me here on All Facts and No Breaks. Nice. Keyshawn Jr. is our moderator who joins us in as well. Oh, um, wow. So, you know, I got to You got to take care of your own because nobody else will. Hey, man, ain't that the truth, man? My, actually, my my oldest son uh, went to your alma mater, got his um, his master's at the prestigious school of your... Um, um, film school. The film school yeah. at, at USC, yes. And now he's working on set um, at Young Sheldon, um, on set, I think, at Paramount, or one of the studios out there. So he's living the lavish life. <laughs> um, and, uh, hey, it's, it's been it's been awesome. Now he's out of my pocket, you know, officially. So I'm, I'm excited about that. And, you know, we got we to gotta start show our younger generation of, of what it's like. And sometimes they got to come work with us in order to learn, you know, how to build, how to survive, um, how to uh, find your next passion. And uh, it's nothing greater than to see your kids thriving in life and being able to work with them in the capacity that you're working with. So, I, I man, I didn't realize that your son was this old at this point in time. I was going to ask if you got any eligibility left. Yeah, no. You know, he, see? No more eligibility. <laughs> he may have eligibility left. I don't think he's nowhere near in shape yeah. to even walk down the stairs, <laughs> let alone play football. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, over the weekend, Johnny Manziel said he is skipping the Heisman ceremony until Reggie Bush gets his trophy back. Mm. Eddie, yeah. as a Heisman winner yourself, do you agree that Reggie should get his Heisman back? I, I do. Um, I really do. I, I signed a petition to help get him his Heisman trophy back. You know, um, to me, he's always a Heisman trophy winner. He put in the work. Um, I, in fact, I voted for him that year that he did win it. Um you know, and Ke Keyshawn can attest to this, you know, in, in college sports, it, it it is what it is. The NIL now is above board. It's something that happened uh, long before Reggie, uh, during Reggie's time. Um, and now that it's deemed as legal, you know, um, I think it's time to to give him his Heisman Trophy back. I, I think it's, it's warranted. Um, we're in a different day and age now. Uh, you know, for Reggie, he can make so much more money now as a Heisman Trophy winner after his playing days than he would have as during the time that he actually won it. That makes sense. So um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely in, 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 in for it. And I think he should um, be recognized as a Heisman Trophy winner because he's, he's definitely deserved it on the field. I don't know how you can say I can attest to that. I never, <laughs> ever took one dime when I was in college, unlike those Ohio Boy, State Buckeyes. Stop it. Hey, you took a pay cut when you got drafted by the Jets. 
Yeah, maybe, <laughs> yeah, maybe yeah, a slight, yeah. maybe a slight <laughs> pay, cut. A pay cut. Yeah, <laughs> maybe just, hey. maybe just a hey. little bit. Yeah, right. You drove up. Uh, I'll never forget this. We're at the Bob Hope um, All American um, uh, uh, show in L.A. And the rest of us are driving up on a bus. We came in on a bus. <laughs> Matter of fact, it was a short bus. And Keyshawn drives up in a Lamborghini, a red one with a beautiful model. Granted, he's still in college. So I'm like, OK, this is how they do it in L.A. No, it wasn't. It wasn't. It wasn't your... No, it wasn't a Lamborghini. It was, it was a Ferrari. Oh, oh so, excuse Ferrari. me. See what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, it was a. Yeah. It was a Ferrari. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, you know so, how like, it goes like I sometimes. Said, that's like I said. You took a pay cut when you got in <laughs> that NFL. That was way, way, way back. You sound like you sound like Ray Lewis when we was at the Playboy All American team <laughs> down in, in Arizona, and he was worried about why did I have a Rolex on. I'm like, don't worry about why I rock it high, rock it high, get out. You, that, you see how it comes out? Yeah, that, now, now, that, I you, can talk. Know, hey, look, I can talk about it now because it's over with. NIL's in place. My school's yep. not worried about it. Yeah, I mean, every now and then you get a perk here, a perk there, you know, but. I wasn't perk paid. There, perk there. Yeah, I just right. knew people. I was that riding had... a bike around Columbus, dog. <laughs> let alone you driving a Ferrari and Rolexes. And I mean, Keyshawn always had um, high standards, and and you know that's the one thing I respected about you, man. Is that not only you know um, were you a great football player, um, but you always had high standards in terms of quality of life your businesses, you know, getting to know you throughout the years, great friend, you know, with the Pro Bowls and playing against you. Um, you worked your ass off. You were a teammate of mine in Dallas. Um, and I've always had tremendous respect for the standard that you set, no matter who it was, whether it was uh, on a football team or your teammates or a certain business that you were looking to get into. Um, and even on your show, you have a standard in terms of how you're going to do things, man. And and it's always uh, always awesome to see how you've just continued to grow and hold people accountable on your staff, you know, to that same standard. You you have to, uh, Eddie. You have to. And you, you talk about our days at the Cowboys. In, in 2004, you had a chance in, in, to stay with the Tennessee Titans, but you decided you're not taking a pay cut. You're going to move on. You want to do something different. You join me in the Dallas Cowboys. And our year obviously didn't go the way we planned it to go. Mm -hmm. Would you make a different decision today if given that same opportunity to maybe just stay with Jeff Fisher and the Tennessee Titans rather than join me and Bill Parcells and the Dallas Cowboys? You know what? I think now I can always look back and say I would have done anything, something different um, because the circumstances didn't work out. Um, but I, I felt in my heart at that time that my time as a Titan was up. Um, and it was a tough decision. You know, I looking back on it, yes, I had more value as a Tennessee Titan than I did as a Dallas Cowboy, but I bet on myself. I yeah. wanted to mm -hmm. see something different. I wanted to learn from a different different system, uh, go to a new city, start, start something fresh. And uh, although it didn't work out in our favor, um, the, some of the things and lessons that I've learned from Bill from that time uh, from Jerry in terms of, again, a standard, how you want to run a business, you know, I've implemented here at Tennessee State, you know, um, although my time was cut short, you know, working with Maurice Carthon and um, the various coaches on that staff, uh, you, you pick up different things along the way, good, bad or different. And that was a great learning experience for me in terms of seeing how things were done from a completely different organization a different set of coaches, how to implement certain things, how you want to get what you want out of certain players at any cost. So, you know, uh, it, it, it's helped me to this day today. So I, I have no regrets about anything that I've done. Um, but as players, you got to understand and know your value, regardless of the situation. You got to stand on your shield and no matter the outcome, you got to know your value and stand and stick to that. So, you know, I do I regret uh, from a hindsight. Uh, maybe I could have played, you know, a, a couple more years here or there. Um, I just knew my value and I stuck on my shield and I, and I still live by that. Mm -hmm. So, Eddie, Derrick Henry said you were a key motivator in leveling up his game as a young player. Take a listen. I had called Eddie. I think we played the Cowboys and then... After that, we had to play the Patriots, and I called Eddie, I think, that night, and, you know, he talked to me. He was like, man, you you running soft. 
You gotta play better. You gotta do. You gotta use your your size to your advantage and let the game come to you. Be patient. You know you ain't always gotta make a big a big play, a big splash play. It's gonna happen. You know, and you know just just keep grinding. And that's what I did. And ever since then, everything's you know start happening. So can you talk about your relationship with Derrick Henry and when you knew he was going to be an elite running back in the NFL? Well, um, I had a, I've had known Derrick since the Heisman uh, ceremony when he won it in 2015. And uh, we've developed a good relationship. He gets drafted to the Tennessee Titans, um, had to sit on the bench for two years, sat behind DeMarco Murray for the first three years. And every opportunity that he had, he was so accustomed to trying to prove himself a break in the long run that he would look passive at times. So when he finally got the show, um, the year that he's talking about, we were in London. And I'll never forget, I'm sitting with Keith Bullock and we're watching the game. And there was an off-tackle play where he square, he could square up the, 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 the linebacker. The linebacker was clearly um, uh, smaller than him. I think I forgot who it was, but I think it was Merriweather. I think he was like 6'1", 220 pounds. And Derek is 6'4", 240. And instead of squaring him up and, and challenging him and imposing his will on him, right. he elects to try to outrun him and he gets cut down and he gets a loss or two. So I said, listen, you know, if I ever have a chance to talk to him, I said, listen, you got to you got to use your size to your advantage. You've got to impose your will on guys and understand that you work inside out. You take the hard two, the hard three, and it, the body blows is a softening process. And understanding that you, the more that you impose your will in the early quarters, that's going to open up. The longer runs are going to happen. And lo and behold, he took a hold of that information, and damn it, yeah. he, he started running 99 yard runs, 90 yard runs. Yeah. I'm like, okay. Slow your ass down. I don't want you to break the, <laughs> my record. <laughs> like, I don't want to be the but, leader rusher. Come on, you're gotta. right, right. <laughs> but, but honestly, uh, seriously, I uh, I'm really proud of Derek. You know what he's become. Um, I, to me, he's still uh, productive back in this league. Um, he's a young 28, a young 29, or excuse me, a young 30 because he didn't take the pounding on the first three years. He still has some tread on the tire. And this in this league, Keyshawn, you know it. Is a passing league. They devalue the running back position. And we're seeing now in this level of free agency, more running backs that are productive that teams are not signing because everything's predicated on supporting the passing attack. And um, we, I think you know, in order to win a championship or contend for a championship, you have to have an element, a strong element of a running game. And not just a committee, but a guy that you, that you can lean on. Eddie, how surprised, speaking of Tennessee Titans, though, how surprised were you that they let Mike Vrabel go mm. and they brought in Callahan to be the head coach? You know, I, I didn't understand it. Um, on some levels, I still don't. I know Callahan's a phenomenal guy, phenomenal coach. Um, but there were some things, I guess, in-house that we're not privy to um, that they felt like it was best to part ways. You know, Mike probably had standards. Um, he probably had some non-negotiables he wasn't willing to bend on and was ready to move on. I think Mike is a phenomenal coach. You know, he was uh, the coach of the year two years ago. Um, you know, uh, was in the playoffs, I think, the majority of his time here. Um, competed against Kansas City uh, for uh, the AFC Championship. So you don't go from being the coach of the year two years ago to not having a job and not having any opportunity I think it was something, you know, where he wanted more power and I get it. I understand it. Um, but I was shocked by that. I thought that he had at least, you know, two more years to write the ship and, you know, replenish the um, the cupboard, figure out the identity moving forward. You know, as this next iteration of older guys move out, how was he going to replenish this team? So, you know, uh, Rand, who was our teammate. Uh, is now the GM at the Tennessee Titans. He has a plan. He has an idea for what he wants. Um, and it probably didn't, didn't coincide with Mike. So um, those things happen. And um, that's the nature of the business. Hmm. Well, Derrick Henry is also set for free agency this month. And it sounded like he was saying his goodbyes after the team's final game in January. Take a listen. Hmm. Titan fans, I just want to say thank you for the 
greatest eight years of my life, the ups and the downs. Y'all been there for everything, through the adversity. Watching me grow as a person and a player, always supporting me. Um, I love y'all. Uh, I love seeing the 22 in the stadium. Hopefully I was an inspiration to all the young kids and everybody in the community. Just thank y'all so much. Man, God is good. And tighten up, baby. Nothing left to be said. Ladies and gentlemen, Derek. So, Eddie, do you think Derek will leave the Tennessee Titans this year? Oh, you know, um, I think all signs are leading to that. Um, I, I don't really pay attention to it too much, but the fact that um, a new head coach is in there, um, they've already drafted uh, a back last year in Taji Spears, who is going to be the guy for um, uh, the Tennessee Titans. You know, it just depends on the market. I think they're going to, you know, probably lowball them in terms of pay. Um, and I think that's going to be the determining factor. And really, what, is it, what does Derrick Henry want to do moving forward? Uh, I think any place that you look on, I don't know if he's ever going to get back to that place where he is the featured back unless their injury occurs. So, you know, he has, he has, he, it, listen, Derrick had put together a Hall of Fame uh, type of career, you know, um, in my opinion. And um, it really depends on what he wants and how he wants his legacy to to um, to finish out. Uh, personally, I think that he has more value as a Titan than any place else. Uh, but the, in this day and age where the NFL has gone and where it's going, you, you've got to take a chance on yourself. And I think Derek has um, more tread on the tire to produce more yards in the right system and the right, the right opportunities for, for anything else. So, um, I, I don't I don't foresee him coming back to the Titans based off of the, the speech and where it's trending. Um, and I, I think the Titans are going to, you know, uh, we'll go in another direction. You know what, man, Eddie, speaking of the future, look like the, the future is bright at Tennessee State right now. You led the team to its first winning season since 2017. The momentum mm -hmm. has shifted in your favor. What are you going to do different this year to continue to build that momentum? Well, Keyshawn, I changed up a few things in the building. Um, you know, when you when you look at anything, uh, especially being in the business now, I look at, you know, our roster. Um, I look at um, our scheme and I look at our staff. Um, those three things I, I assess and I look at how can we get better? You know, we started off six and two last year. Um, should have won nine games, um, finished off the season and, you know, uh, not very well lost the last three games. And it, you know, a lot of it falls on my shoulders in terms of situational football, but you know, we weren't producing enough points. We weren't efficient in our run game. So I changed up the offensive identity. So, uh, getting a new offensive coordinator, a new O-line coach, um, shifting up the way that we, we play the game from going from more of a spread to more of a, a 13 personnel, 12 personnel team, uh, more of a, a downhill running attack, play action, RPO system, um, and a tougher team. You know, uh, it, it, everything is based off of this spring. Our, our mission is to be tougher and to have an identity and physicality, period. You know, it's going to be when we put the pads on, it's going to be sparks flying. And, and that's what I expect to see, you know, football at its finest. And, and, and with, with that mentality, um, that's what I want to see moving forward is, is that this is who we're going to be. This is how we want to operate. We're going to get downhill. We're going to run, tackle, hit with bad intentions and play with discipline, be focused. And that's, that's where we're going. So, um, all that said, man, you know, I spend my time, you know, trying to find the right people, you know, <laughs> Bill Parcells talks about the ingredients. So just over my shoulder, you know, I got a board of, of athletes that I'm trying to get, you know, the right, the right kids. You know, not looking for necessarily the transfer portal for guys that are coming from USC or Ohio State. I'm trying to find kids that are from D2 levels, that are, that are looking, that are a little bit hungrier, from JCs that are hungry, they got a chip on their shoulder, and they have something to prove. So um, that's the next step, man, is to put together another winning season but a championship season. Well, like my dad said, congrats on your first winning season as the head coach at Tennessee State. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. So the NFL draft is coming up and there was only one player from an HBCU drafted last year. The mm -hmm. HBCU NFL combine was held last month. But what else can be done to make sure the NFL doesn't forget all that talent that's still out there? 
and invite the HBCU players to the NFL combine. Period. I, I mean, I think it's a noble idea to have an HBCU combine, but it, it still doesn't help the cause in terms of, hey, take the HBCU players, let them compete against the guys that around the country, the power five schools that are coming from Ohio State, from Michigan, from USC, from or Oregon, and let them see. There was a kid that came from our conference, um, a receiver from uh, from SEMO. I can't think of his name right now, but he ran a 4-4-4 at the combine. And he played in our conference that we've seen him the past couple of years. So the players are there. The talent is there. So I don't I, – I'm, I'm all for it, the HBCU combine, but let's see how many players actually get an opportunity after performing in that. They have the HBCU, HBCU combine and an all-star game in the same weekend. So we, Keyshawn, we've had our pro days. You're in football shape, and then you are in combine shape. Mm -hmm. You can't put your best foot forward in combine shape if you're playing a game in the same week. So right. I don't want to hear about you know just the the HBCU combine because to me that's just saying, hey, here is your final, your final chance at you know to lay everything on the line. You know, uh, here is your final. Um, uh, opportunity to show what you can do. And if you can make it out of here, great. If you don't, then so be it. I think it's just a, a checkbox versus a real opportunity for kids at the HBCU level to get a real look at playing in the, in, at the NFL. Eddie, wh why do you think that that is and is, is treated differently than the NC2A and the Power Five schools and things of that nature? Because historically, as you know, HBCU has always turned out historically yes. some of the greatest players that ever lace them up in the National Football League. Tennessee State has two, two NFL Hall of Famers, Richard Dent and Claude Humphrey. Ed Tutal Jones was the first overall pick, I believe, in the 1970 draft. So historically, you mean we talk about, you can go around the league, Shannon Sharp, uh, Aeneas Williams, um, Doug Williams, all Steve McNair have all come from HBCU. So the talent is there. Um, and for for some strange reason, I, I don't know uh, all the nuances and details and why we're, we're not getting the same opportunities to be to show our talent or compete at a high level. And going back to the combine question to solve that, I think you should they should slot at least 20 slots or 15 slots from HBCUs to compete at the combine. Give them that equal opportunity or have uh, an opportunity to go to the Reese's uh, Senior Bowl in Mobile, Alabama, where all the scouts are at and slot it for five guys or six guys to from HBCUs to compete and that, during that week down in Mobile, Alabama during the course of the week. And let, and let it be on the film. Let it be on the field. So, you know, to answer your question, Keyshawn, I, I, I don't understand it. I don't know. We, we, we constantly talk about equality and um, equal opportunity and more spotlight for the HBCUs. But I feel like in some instances, you know, they're just saying, OK, we're just going to give you your day. And it really doesn't mean anything, but it allows these guys to to come at peace with the ending, you mm -hmm. know, and not really give them an opportunity. So. I think it's I think there's still room for growth. I think it's, it still needs to be an even playing field, which is not. I think it's just all for show at this point in time and to, as far as getting these kids a real opportunity to compete. Coach, we often hear how NIL and the transfer portal affect power five schools. But what are the challenges you face with the changes of college football at the HBCU level? It's a trickle down effect. I, I think now, you know, we're seeing a lot of these collectives being created um, at the power five level. And, and, you know, they're trying to still put parameters around that. Mm -hmm. um, here at Tennessee State, we really haven't seen a whole lot of it. Um, I'm trying to use my resources, my business connections in the Nashville community to create more opportunities for our kids. I do believe there is a place for NIL. I mean, I do believe kids should be compensated for their name, image, and likeness uh, because the way that college football was intended to be 50 years ago um, is not the way it is now. It's a billion-dollar business. It has grown tremendously, and a lot of people are benefiting off of that. The coaches, the staff, 
um, ADs, other schools are benefiting off of the blood, sweat, equity of, of football and basketball. And for them not to get a piece of the pie is is a travesty. So I think there is opportunities uh, for that. Now, I think within that, you've got to put parameters around it. It has to be drawn in a little bit in terms of, of pay scale, of opportunities off the field, you know, what that looks like um, and so forth. So um, for, for me personally, um, I, I try to focus in on how can I teach my kids how to set up financial literacy programs for themselves when they get into it. So they're not surrounded by um, bad people in terms of agents and and marketing people. How can you set up um, a a platform for success within the NIL space? So it's setting up an LLC It's understanding that I have to pay taxes out of this money. Or if I'm getting a car deal, somebody's going to pay taxes on that. Who is that going to be? You know, so there's opportunity there for that, um, as well as them getting paid and understanding that, hey, I, I'm a brand and how do I build on that brand? So that's kind of how I look at it. Hey, Eddie, uh, what's it what's it like coaching and working, essentially working with your son, Eric? Now, I want to ask you this. How did you how, what did you you came up with the the E.I. I mean, E.R.I.Q. I've never seen it spelled that way. Who came up with that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, my wife and I, you know, we wanted to make it unique. Uh, a- actually, there is an actor, uh, LaSalle, Eric LaSalle, is spelled like that. Is that e- right? E-R-I-Q. No, no. Yeah, E-R-I-Q. Help me remember, did you meet Taj through me or did you meet her <laughs> elsewhere? I'm just trying to, I don't know if she, it was my party that they performed at. I was trying to remember. It was, it was a couple spots. So I met Taj actually when we played Alabama in the Citrus Bowl in uh, 1994, okay. the year before I won the Heisman. Yep. And she dissed me. I asked her for autographs. She said <laughs> she was busy. She had time for me. I said, okay. okay. Then the next year, 95, I won the Heisman. We was in New York City. Went to Chad's and Wilson's. Okay, yeah, and Chad's and Wilson. Yep, yep. <laughs> you remember Chad's and Wilson's? And she was in there. She recognized me. We started talking. Okay. Then we didn't hook up right, quite then. Then it was at your party we saw each other again. Okay. We exchanged numbers. Yes. So it yes. was like a like a, a three part series to to her courting me. I courted her, and it was she she plays it like I tried to get on her. I was like, nah, 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 nah. It was a lot of options in the room that night. No, you know, I, so. I you know I was I was wondering because they performed <laughs> because they performed at my birthday party, my thirtieth birthday right. party, I think it was. And I was wondering. I kept saying, I wonder if because we was together, and I, I didn't remember them around us even though they were right. performing I was wondering as I was coming up the stairs I was like I wonder if he met her at my birthday party I certainly yeah, had was, to ask you that it was quite a quite a few times man we met you know you know how it is man <laughs> in New York at these parties and it was it's uh, the all-star weekends were epic you know yeah of course it ain't like it is now so yeah no, it, was, it was it was love so it what's it love. like what's it like coaching your son you know it's a blessing Keon. I mean, it is, um, I didn't come into this profession trying to coach my son or, or, um, you know, uh, get him a scholarship. He's going to be on his own merit. You know, he had an opportunity to go to, to, to other schools, but he saw what I was doing here and he basically said, dad, I want to help, you know, change this program around. And, um, it's been awesome, you know, to go down to the indoor facility or walk down the hallway to the defensive line room and to, and to to challenge him to hold him to a high standard like I do it at the crib, um, you know, kids see firsthand my relationship with my boy. You know, I don't when I'm here, I'm a coach. It yeah. ain't it ain't you know no dad no favors. In fact, it's worse for him. So as it um, should, but be. but you know this to have an impact at this stage in his life to constantly hammer home uh, the selflessness that you have to have being a good teammate showing up on time, before time, being prepared, having a pen and pad everywhere you go, um, you know, being respectful, you know, all the all the corny things that we learned from our coaches growing up. Um, I'm, you know, I, I see the value in that now. And, and um, you know, having a spiritual relationship with God, you know, letting that be your guiding light. I mean, all those things, 
you know, um, having an impact on him on a day to day basis has been been a blessing for me. And it's something that that I couldn't have cooked up or created, man. <laughs> mm -hmm. So we recently had Raiders head coach Antonio Pierce come on the show, who was once a former player. I'm sure you know. But can you speak oh, yeah. on how being a former player makes you a better coach? You played the game. I mean, when you when you have played the game at a high level, you right. when you're in the trenches and you understand, you know, the day to day grind of what it takes to become a uh, pro bowler or um, uh, a Super Bowl contender. Um, it is constant. It's discipline. It's consistency. It's, it's managing pain. It's sacrificing a nightlife or sacrificing commercial here or there because you have to be at practice or training. Is prioritizing your time wisely. You know, everybody, if you make it in the NFL on talent, you know, that's one thing. But to separate yourself from that point is your work ethic, your consistency, and your ability to um, stay healthy and, 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 and making sure you're, you're making your body your number one priority. That is your number one job. So understanding all of that, you impart that on to your team. Not only are, can you just you talk about it or, or, or explain to them, here's what you have to do. You've lived it and you're living it. Mm -hmm. So when you understand the nuances and the absolute details of a, spe a specific um, position or play or whatever that is, they can't tell you that not only are you the head coach, but you were the architect, you were the builder, you was in the grind, you were building the, 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 the meal, you were building the, 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 the foundation. So it's not too much anybody that hasn't played the game can tell you. You know, everybody wants to talk about analytics and analytics and analytics and hell with analytics. You know, it, it has a, a place in terms of, you know, helping you make a sound decision. But sometimes it's like, listen, we got this guy on his heels. He he's he's hurt. He's he's favoring a, the right side. We want to attack him. Mm -hmm. You know, I'll never forget when we played Keyshawn uh, when he was with the Jets in 98. And <laughs> they were a team that was just trying to find out who they were. They were right at the crossroads of really becoming good. And they went on a, uh, a championship run after they played us in Tennessee. And it was a tie ball game going into halftime. They came out and posed their will. We never scored another point. I think it was like 24 to 10. Keyshawn had a field day on our cornerback. So in the... And next day in the paper, we read his quotes. He said, yeah, you know, Bill Parcells told us if we lose this game, we got to find our own way, own way back home. And um, taking and I imposed my will on one of our cornerbacks. It was like taking candy from a baby. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah, I never, I never forgot that quote. But that's that's what I'm talking about. That's the dog in them. And, you know, we saw a team that would love one one game. Two years prior to that, to go on to play in the AFC Championship because of the mindset and and the the accountability and the dog mentality that they had. I could tell you the corner was it was Daryl Lewis. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I know I know exactly who it was. But look, speaking speaking of former former you know form, being a former player and whatnot, I want to read off some of your accolades because they are Hall of Fame worthy to me. Heisman Trophy winner 1995, which you stole from me, but that's a whole nother story. <laughs> College hey, Football I, Hall I, of I Famer. <laughs> College Football <laughs> Hall of Famer. NFL Offensive Rookie of the Year in 96. Four-time Pro Bowler, two-time All-Pro. Rushed for 1,000 yards, seven of the nine seasons you played. Most career rushing yards in Titans history, over 10,000. Uh, 28th all-time in the NFL. Only the second NFL running back to rush for 10,000 yards while never missing a start. Only one other guy who Hall of Famer, the late Jim Brown. You had 78 career touchdowns. Do you feel at any time you belong in the Pro Football Hall of Fame? You've been a finalist, a semifinalist twice. And do you think you think about it at all that one day you could potentially be in Canton? You know what, Keith? Um, uh, you know... That's that's not on me, honestly. I don't. I try not to get too deeply involved in that. You know, um, I think the resume speaks for itself. Um, is it comparable to some guys that are in there? Probably. Um, and it's 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 one of those deals where you just don't quite 
understand what the criteria is. It seems like um, it's a moving goalpost sometimes. You know, uh, I think now that running backs aren't in vogue, it kind of hurts my my chances of getting in. Um, but um, I don't spend a lot of my time thinking about it. I think my wife spends a lot of time thinking about it. You have to hear, oh, you deserve, I, I can't get into all that. You know, um, when is my time is my time. But I, I'm, you know, I'm very proud and appreciative that the fact that I'm even in the conversation is, is an accomplishment unto itself, man. Um, so, you know, to answer your question, um, I don't, it doesn't consume me. Um, uh, shit. I mean, my, my time, my, my post, my, my, my score is posted. Is it, yeah. I'm in the, I'm in the clubhouse. There's nothing really I can do about it. And I can't get mad about it. I just got to continue to, you know, pray and hope that it happens. And if it does, you know, it's a day that it's really a day that you have a chance to, um, thank those that have helped you is their day, you know? So at this point in time in my life, it, it's it's hard because my mom isn't here. My father isn't here. Um, some important people that have helped me get to this point, that was their day. Yeah. So, you know, that, that part is probably the toughest part of it all. But, you know, if I get in, man, it'll be a blessing. Um, and if I don't, I'm just going to continue to do what I've been doing. Well, one person that probably thinks you should be in is Ray Lewis. <laughs> the rivalry between you and him was one of the best in football. Let's take a look at this video. Ray said something like, if I saw you uh, on the football field, uh, you know, I'd take you out. I said, man, you're too light in the ass, man. <laughs> Eddie, really? I was like, wait a minute now. <laughs> be careful now. Because we knew the brand of football that we both played. See, if, if you if you blink and if you wink and you shut them, I got you. That joke ain't never shut them. It's a new sheriff in town. Nah, nah. All right. Game on. Pop this back in. I was willing to die on that football field that day. So can you remind <laughs> young... <laughs> Can you remind <laughs> young football fans what your era of football was like <sighs> and, and, and how beating Ray Lewis and the Ravens, was that maybe your biggest motivator in your NFL career? If I wouldn't say my biggest motivator was becoming a Super Bowl champion, you know, and they, and they were in the way. Um, you got to understand, man, you know, in, our, in the 90s, it, it was no joke, you know, um, and specifically the AFC, the AFC Central was, was murder's row. And it was um, Pittsburgh, Jacksonville, who was back then um, uh, uh, an incredible team. And I think they, we we were the only team to beat them that year twice. Beat them three times to go to the AFC Championship game in 99. Um, the, the Browns, they were sorry. Um, the Cincinnati <laughs> Bengals. And then there was... Uh, they were sorry. <laughs> and then was Baltimore. So we all... And we played... Um, each other twice a year, and it it was it was no joke. It was playing in a telephone booth, and again, it was a physical game, and and, and you could you, there was no room for the weak, and every every week you were getting tested. But but clearly for me and Ray, you know, we came out in the same draft, that '96 draft, which was shit. Keyshawn was number Keyshawn, one. You had Kevin Hardy, you had Simeon Rice, you had. T.O., you had Marvin Harrison, you had Ray Lewis, you had me, Jonathan Ogden. So it was loaded. And, you know, in the 96 draft, we all talk, we all talk trash. And it just kind of built from there. So Ray's a good friend of mine, but in between the white lines, man, it was, it was, it wasn't fair. I mean, it was, it was no, it was no um holds bar. And if you kill somebody on the field that day, then God bless you. That was it. That that's that was understood. That's how life was. So um Nah, man, it, it was uh, definitely competitive. And when we both, both of our teams got good um, in the late 90s, early 2000s, and you could see the rivalry really take place, um, it, was, it was definitely tough. So uh, for me, you know, going up against him on a consistent basis was more about um, a power of will, man. I, I, I mean, it, it was a true spiritual battle because – he knew where I was getting, I was getting the ball and I knew where he was going to be. And it was just a matter of, okay, who's going to win this war within this moment right now. And, uh, and I, I'm still feeling those hits. <laughs> 
So you recently attended the groundbreaking ceremony for the $2.1 billion new Nissan Stadium. Can you speak about the Titans-TSU relationship and how this stadium will benefit the Tigers? Yeah, well, we play in the stadium now. Um, uh, TSU does, and we've been playing in there since... Actually, I've been with the Titans since 2000. Um, and it's, it's, it's going to be a great opportunity for our Tennessee State fan base to experience classics that we're hoping to have in the stadium against other HBCUs. Um, but it's also my hope that we can leverage this relationship into helping us get more resources built on campus, you know, better practice facility, uh, revamping Hale Stadium so we can play our other opponents here on campus. Um, it's it's cool to be in a stadium, but our fan base, um, you know, prefers something more intimate and uh, rightfully so. It's, it's right as of right now, um, it is not conducive for a college football atmosphere. Uh, with, but with this new stadium, with the bells and whistles, um, you know, 365 day facility, you know, with uh, entertainment on the outside, you got retail, you got restaurants. Uh, Keyshawn can appreciate this because, you know, he, he's probably built some of these things. Um, that's where it's kind of going. I think that it's a great opportunity for our alumni and fan base to take part of and take ownership in. So I think it can be a perfect marriage, you know, for us to have moving forward, you know, with the Titans and with Tennessee State, you know, and helping us build our footprint on campus, but also um, having a presence at the new Nissan Stadium. Well, not only are you making an impact at Tennessee State as a football coach, but you've also joined the efforts to bring MLB to Nashville. Why is Nashville the best city for an expansion team? It's the it city. Hey, you know, um, over the last 20 years or so, we've seen an explosion in tourism. Um, that's been the main, the main mainstay. People from all over the world, the country, especially bridal showers, are coming to Nashville, Tennessee. Why? Um, I don't know, <laughs> but you know, it's, it's been remarkable to see the growth here. Um, you know, the Titans came here in, in, in 98, uh, became the Titans in 99, 2000, uh, really brought a spotlight nationally speaking to Tennessee or Nashville. And then the emergence of, um, the, the, the predators and hockey, when they went on their run a couple years back, we've hosted the, uh, NFL draft. Uh, which we're supposed to be getting um, in the in the future again, which was very successful. But you know, over a million people here in in, ten, in, the, in the downtown area. We've uh, built up enough hotels in Nashville to support that. Uh, with the with the the new stadium being built, we're expecting to host a Super Bowl, host a uh, national championship game in college football. NCAA basketball. So the city is getting ready and being built to have to add on another another team. You know, when you look at emerging cities around the country that can can host events like this, Vegas um, is one of them as a competitor, but also um, uh, us, Nashville, Tennessee as well. You know, we, we have the country music. We're centrally located, easy to get to. Um, people are drawn to, to Broadway. Um, but I think the biggest thing now, you know, with gambling, being um, uh, uh, something that's being accepted in, in professional sports and certainly college, people don't have to fly to Vegas to do that. I think they can do it anywhere else. So I think the convenience of it being centrally located um, as well as the city constantly emerging and growing, even through the, the, the downtimes, has, uh, is making it an attractable place for Major League Baseball to expand to. Hey, Eddie, you mentioned Broadway. So you 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 gave up your leotards and everything to, to be a football coach, huh? <laughs> <laughs> you, you gave it up, man. Or you go, at some point, will We're you go about, back? Yo, no, 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 no. no at some tux. point, will you go I, back? No, 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 no. It was a tuxedo. I ain't never <laughs> wore leotards. There was no leotards. I don't think it's hard to do. At some point, though, will you, will, will you go back to Broadway? You know what? When, yes, because I'm right now. I'm in the process of putting together a script. Okay, the, the life, the life of Keyshawn Johnson. <laughs> so I'm gonna, I'm gonna start. I'm gonna start as Keyshawn. <laughs> It's going, give me the damn ball. That's what we call. No, I don't know, man. I don't know what uh, what's in store. You know, I think it. You know. Um, that part of me, that life, you know, presented an opportunity for me to grow, to learn, 
a different discipline and a different capacity. Uh, enjoyed my time, you know, uh, on Broadway. Uh, and I, 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 I mean, at this point in my life, Key, I'm just about, you know, giving back and, and, and pouring into the next generation through my skill set that I've all gone through, whether that be as an entrepreneur, um, as an actor, as, um, as a father, as a husband, as a football coach. Um, and I'll see what, what opportunities present itself, you know, in the next five to 10 years. Hmm. Okay. Okay. So Justin Fields recently named his Mount Rushmore of Ohio State football, and it includes you, Ezekiel Elliott, Troy Smith, and Ted Ginn Jr. Mm. What are your thoughts on his list and who is on your Ohio State Mount Rushmore? Wow, bro, that's that's we got some dudes now. I mean, this is I, I didn't even go um, to Ohio I, you State. Know, I that's his you opinion. I like it. Mount Zeke Rushmore is, is than a that. good one. Um, was that? I, I didn't go to Ohio State. And I could give you a better Mount Rushmore than that. Oh, you can. So, so I mean, I can too. I, I can too. I mean, it's, yeah, of course but, but I he can. His, so, uh, so, so I want to hear yours. I'll give you mine. Uh, it doesn't have to. St- when does it start? What what years? Every year, dog. Every every Rushmore. era. So, first of all, you got to start with. <laughs> Archie damn Griffin. There you go. Yeah. There you go. Then you go to Eddie George. And then you go Orlando Pace. There you go. And then from there, you can add whoever you want to on the fourth spot. Those are the top three dudes at Ohio State. Then if you if you wanted to go Sean Springs, and then you wanted to go Troy Smith or Zika, all them types, you can do that if you wanted to. Because the fourth slot, they got so many players, you can pick the fourth slot. But the top yeah. three yeah. are the three that I just named. Archie period. Griffin. How you going to miss on Archie Heisman. Griffin? <laughs> That's two, the only two-time Heisman yeah. trophy one. Yeah. So, Come yeah. I, I would start there. I would definitely say O-Pace. Um, I, 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 I could throw myself in there. Um, I'm going to say um, CeCe, Chris Carter. You know, oh, yeah. uh, he, I mean, his body of work speaks for itself. He was a dog. You know what I'm saying? Um, but we talking uh, about just college, Kramer. though. We ain't talking about pros. We're not talking about college. But, but, no, but, but CC was a dude. So you can throw Terry Glenn in there. You can go I mean, TG. So you can put TG yeah. in there. Right? For sure. That, yeah, would, yeah, be, that would probably Troy be one. Troy Smith is another one. Troy Smith. Um, Sean yeah, Springs. Yeah, Sean I mean, Springs. so the Sean Springs you can throw in there. I mean, most was, recently... Uh, t- yeah, Sean. I'm trying to think who else. Ted Ted Ginn, um, probably. Ted Ginn, uh, you know, maybe, maybe. Maybe I'm Braxton Miller in there. I don't know about y'all, but nah, Braxton, 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 Braxton was exciting to watch. <laughs> yeah, but he didn't um, finish the deal. He didn't he finish. Well, listen, you got to throw Maurice Claret name in there too. I mean, you he, oh, he only gave Claret one year, there. but but he but he led them to a national championship. So I think. I think you, you know that four slot can be can be a revolving do- door, you know, for that. You I, know, so. I, I, I know we got to let you go, Eddie. You got other things to do, but I got one last question for you. Absolutely. I just want to know why did y'all run from me in 1995 <laughs> and didn't make it to the road? Why? why? Oh. I asked Sean Springs that all the time. I, no, I used to ask you know Terry what? that all the time. Now you I'm asking what? you, you know. why did y'all run from me? I was the only dude. Y'all had a plethora of players. I was the only dude, and y'all choked. Y'all choked <laughs> to the point that I had to honor oh, you with my USC oh helmet my and put Buckeye oh. stickers on the back of my USC helmet oh, and wear it in the Rose Bowl. That's who we going with? I just want to know. That's who we going with? I just hey, hey we, we, we said, okay, we just want Keyshawn to play against uh, Northwestern so he could solidify his number one slot <laughs> in the NFL draft. That's what we, because had we done that, I don't know. You might have you might have even slipped down to top fifteen, bro. <laughs> <laughs> you, ended, you you ended off against Northwestern with almost three hundred yards receiving. Not my fault, y'all. Didn't, y'all didn't close the deal. Hey, hey, listen. You know what? That year, that year, that was a special year. Uh, Keyshawn's talk about ninety five, undefeated, number two in the country, playing against that team up north. And uh, just like in typical fashion, they underachieved throughout the entire year. And, I, you know, I, I, they just came out and played their behinds off. I mean, it was one of those deals that, you know, you don't look at any other games, no other games in terms of the preparation for that week because because they're going to be a completely different team. Mm-hmm. 
And they were Charles Woodson was a freshman at the time. Had a career day. I think he had two uh, interceptions. Bianca Batuka, um, Tim Bianca Batuka, who uh, was also in the '96 draft. Keyshawn yep. rushed for over 300 yards against us. He went to the Carolina Panthers at number eight. Um, so you know, it was a it was a talented team, um, but one that we went up there, and that's how that game goes, man. Lose that one game and then knock us out. But for sure, we wanted to play y'all so bad. Oh, I wanted so to, bad. Oh, oh, so I wanted to play y'all. Wanted you. Oh, I wanted oh. to play y'all so bad. I wanted oh, to play I Shadow wanted, Springs in the worst way. How many games did y'all win that year? I think we won nine? ten. I think we won ten. I, I think it was nine. No, I think no, no, nine no, no, no. We 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 like got y'all, ten. Y'all did no, we as ten. usual. Y'all no, still had receivers as usual. No, we had ten. <laughs> no, but we wanted to see y'all in the worst way. I wanted to see Shadow Springs in the worst way. Oh, I wanted to see him so bad. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah. But it didn't happen, man. And, and we remain friends and close friends to yes, this day. Yes, we did. So. Yes, we did. You know, congratulations to all the success that you have in out in Nashville, Tennessee. Man, and let's do this. It, let's do this again one day, Eddie. Hey, man, have me on anything you want, man. I, hey, Keisha, I'm so proud of you, man. Uh, and what you got going on with your son, you continue to reinvent yourself in so many ways. And the conversations we had from family, life, business, you know, the 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 stuff that you gave me um, in Dallas, you know, just in terms of the wisdom and the knowledge, man, has been 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 remarkable man and the thing i cherish the most man is the relationships that we've had yes through the years you know we yeah. can always not talk to each other for five years come right back and it pick up right where we left off yeah. man it's been remarkable so you keep doing your thing dog and uh keep 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 grinding man it's been awesome knowing you bro all right thanks a lot thanks Thank for joining for me that's a wrap today Thanks again to Eddie George for joining the show. And don't forget to subscribe and follow All Facts Pod on social media. Until then, it's Keyshawn. I'll see y'all soon. 